This swamp doesn't yet seem that bad, but it only takes three seconds for the first of many, many savage undead monstrosities to encroach. Everyone scrambles to a freshly mined out cave for some semblance of safety in this terrifying land. Here, Dwarf Fortress's complexities and challenge are compounded by the evil aura infesting this place reanimating the dead and attracting the worst beasts ever recorded in Dwarven history. It's a deadly combination, but the site is critically important for establishing a foothold on the continent and for stopping the ever-expanding goblin threat to the north. Only only time will tell if the outpost of Brass Wars can stand strong or if it's doomed to crumble. The uncertainty of monsters above and limited foodstuffs below both demand immediate growth. A stoneworker's shop is among the most basic of them, but a craft dwarf here will turn stone into all kinds of furniture. It's not even in before an evil fog rolls across the surface. No one knows what it does, no one wants to find out. They wall off the entrance to stop any fog that reaches it from sinking in. That crude wall will eventually be replaced by a rock hatch, but someone has to make one at the stoneworker's shop before a builder will be able to install it at the entrance. A craft dwarf's workshop and a mechanic station go in nearby to start off a stoneworking quarter. A woodworking quarter gets started on the floor below with a carpenter station to make wood furniture and goods with what was stashed away before the front was walled off. And only with that for now, those undead dingomen have wandered close. Anybody leaving the compound would probably draw their ire so that wall is staying in place. Fortunately, dwarves are experts at feeding themselves without ever seeing the sun. Dobar and Kubik start mining out a section closer to the surface for a kitchen and some farm plots on that clay heavy soil. The wagon did bring some food and drink, but it's gonna run out before long probably at least. Without anyone dedicated to checking the stocks, everyone only has a rough estimate. Olin, the expedition leader, sets up and carves out a small space to be an office, then designates himself as a manager, broker, and bookkeeper. He's more fit for this than other physical laborers, and no one complains even when he starts issuing work orders. Some of these are one-time demands, but others are recurring goals. He tells Dobar to make meals and drinks, but only when there aren't enough stored away. With the dingoes leaving the nearby area, the dwarves unseal the entrance and wander out to secure more wood. Wood's always going to be highly sought after for both furniture and eventually for metalworking. The rock hatch gets installed atop the staircase and a lever goes in closer to the entrance before more undead can near. Undead drakes swoop in before the last dingo beastman leaves. They're surely terrifying ducks. A drake isn't a dragon, it's actually just a male duck, and the dwarves all breathe a sigh of relief. But they understandably need more than just temporary reprieve. Olin tells everyone that he's gonna start them working on a couple of projects for fun and not just function. Everyone's had to sleep on the ground for the month it's been since getting here, though with Kubik busy cooking, Dobar alone has to mine out bedrooms. They also start to establish a dining hall near the kitchen, keeping production chains, in this case from farm to storage to kitchen to storage to dining hall, all close to each other is a really good way to reduce hauling time and keep everything working efficiently. Keeping bedrooms nearby to each other isn't quite efficient, but big apartments are easiest to plan. Everyone but Allen gets one. He's gonna have a bedroom near his office, but it'll be the last bedroom installed. This is his outpost, and he's not gonna have anyone else bearing hardships that he won't shoulder if he can. It doesn't take long for another evil fog to roll in. It might be chance bringing it to the doors, but rumors about what kind of necromancer or witch might be responsible start swirling about brass wars. The hat should keep it out, but it also keeps everyone Everyone huddled inside for now. An ashery goes in near the wood stockpile to start making soap, and a trade depot goes in near the entrance. A wood burning furnace also goes in to start making charcoal, which will be used for smelters who eventually quit brave soldiers with metal armor and weapons. Unfortunately, the miners tunneling down have found neither iron nor coal to make that any better. Despite that, a forge and a smelter go in on the level below for when they do. With the start of a functioning economy that's able to equip soldiers in, it's time to turn to other problems. Food's getting low for both the dwarves and the horses that originally pulled the wagon here. The undead outside means it's dangerous to pasture them out there, and there's only really one way to fix both problems. It involves a butchery and inviting that evil aura a little closer to home. To combat that, Kubik steps up as the militia commander. Bomrek and Risen step up to join him as the first squad of soldiers. Another dwarf leads the horse over and slaughters him into parts. Meat, fat, bones, the undead hair brought back to life by disgusting black magic desperate to enact revenge, and skin. Kubik quickly dispatches it. This is what combat looks like, although it's usually more than just a single brief haircut. The hair will keep reanimating until it's dealt with more permanently, which means that a farmer's workshop goes in to turn it into thread. The alternative is letting these two chill near the entrance forever. Olin's the only one brave enough to grab the hair liable to come back in his hands, drag it to the farmer's workshop, and spin it down into thread. It'll eventually be used for clothes or for suturing wounds, but maybe don't tell whoever's getting stitched up that the thread is haunted. All the meat from the horses and the first harvest from the farms above has the pantry looking a lot better. Everyone could use some help with their mood, especially Arisen. Maybe 
maybe a fancy outfit, a loom, and a clothier goes in while a place for a leatherworking starts across the hall. Maybe she also just needs better armor. She is a soldier, forced to fight undead monstrosities with nothing but a dress to protect her. The dwarves still only have access to copper, but Dobar mines out more of the tetrahedrite that'll be smelted down and reforged into the armor. Copper's among the worst metals for it, but it's better than nothing. Hopefully they find iron soon. With armor coming in on the horizon, it's time to start digging out a barracks above the entrance and to carve out a tavern for more relaxation and socialization. It wouldn't do to have an unhinged soldier get depressed and start killing everyone. Who knows? A visiting bard might even improve some of their moods, especially now that some kids are here. It's been close to half a year since the original seven founded Brass Roars. Somehow, and for some ungodly reason, a few migrants wander in. It's two competent soldiers married to each other, plus two of their children. Sweet, maybe, but undead storks arrive moments after the kids do. It's kind of funny, but it might be a little bit funnier if they didn't want to take the kids away. Everyone gets underground, then yeah, they're gonna stay that way for now. Colonizing the surface will happen eventually, but without a litany of well-equipped soldiers, it's just asking for way too much trouble. Even the thought of surviving on the surface with Dubar staring at a corner. How to press? Oh, actually, he's pretty happy. Dude's just enjoying himself. This place must be a lot more thrilling than the graphical update shows. A bard wanders over, and while accepting random people is a good way to have spies or other threats infiltrate, no one's attacking Brass Wars just yet, though. Any place good enough for a bard ought to be making its own instruments. Unfortunately, each one needs parts of various components, and Brass Wars can only make one. The rest need unavailable bone, leather, clay, and or glass, but all of that is going to take a backseat to metalworking, which still needs a ton of labor. Olin's caught in a fight with some of the undead storks, but despite being unarmed, he's able to easily handle himself and punch a few to death before actual soldiers arrive to slaughter the rest. The corpses are too mangled to be butchered into useful parts, and the lack of any nearby undead means that worse ones can show up. Giant undead blackbirds soar through the skies. Any kind of giant creature is terrifying in combat even when not undead, which means that it's time to burrow and stay safe yet again. Storing more wood should have been a higher priority while it was safe to go out since metalworking takes so much charcoal, but that'll just have to slow down for now. There's still no iron, but it's nearing when traders will arrive and they may have some to sell. Brass stores can make plenty of gem encrusted silver crafts to hopefully afford some. There's no way that any caravan is going to have enough ore for everything that brass stores needs. So it's time to start exploratory mining with long lines spaced apart to maximize the chances that they hit a vein of the stuff. There's always more mining to do above though. A hospital goes near the entrance. It's close to where battle will be and near the kitchen, which will be good for sharing a singular well supporting boat. No one has any experience or skill as a doctor, but Olin at least has some skill as a liar, which will be good for when he's ineptly treating a terminal patient who doesn't know that he has no doctor skill. Don't tell the traders or visiting officials that that's how Brass Wars operates. They bring news about the world and let Olin ask them to bring a couple of goods next year. More wood, since venturing out is starting to get dangerous, some hematite to smelt into iron bars, coal to save on wood, and clay for an eventual kill. The traders here sell seeds, a few bits of equipment, an iron anvil, a couple animals for slaughter, and a couple other goods in exchange for some silver crafts. Making more of these is going to be absolutely required to maintain needed trade, since they're most of what brass wars can actually export. Such impressive wealth draws another couple soldiers, a legendary leather worker, and more kids that brass wars can greet by actually digging out the well. A channel goes in from where it'll be to the nearby aquifer, and the stone there will leak water constantly and infinitely, so that dwarves can use it for both medical work and for brewing. The miners actually hit a native gold vein, which means that Brass Wars now has more gold than actually useful iron. Gold can at least be turned into expensive crafts, but that's not really going to help until the next trader arrives. That won't be for at least half a year, and who knows what's going to attack before them. If the soldiers can't be better equipped, it'll pay to be better prepared. The full army consists of eight soldiers. Vukar and Lickit will be marks dwarves, while the others fight with an assortment of melee weapons, a second smithery can start forging. They'll all get a full set of the finest copper armor that Brass Wars can make, along alongside orders to start training every other month. Not having them in the labor pool during that time is going to be a hit to the economy, but an untrained dwarf is a dead one in these trying lands. Oh, that's finally magnetite. That's one of the ores that can be smelted down into the iron. Hopefully the vein's big. An entertainer? Yeah, sure, get in here. Okay, it's not a huge vein, but at least this is something. It's actually enough to attract one of the king's consorts. Who's convincing everyone to venture all the way out here? The land's important, sure, but it's a dangerous trek. That Cassarite isn't iron, but any dwarf worth their salt, or anyone who ever played RuneScape, knows that the tin within it and the copious amounts of copper on the higher levels will make powerful bronze that's much better than the copper gear soldiers currently use. 
Ages. Hopefully that tides everyone over until steel's a little bit more abundant. And at the same time, the outpost clearly needs to be a bit less generally terrible. Miners work on expanding the tavern and carving out a space for a temple near the bedrooms. The tavern's empty space is technically a dance floor, but dancing on black sand just sounds like pain. The front also gets some actual defenses. A bridge is built out over a channeled out hole. The nearby lever turns this into a drawbridge. Pulling it will raise the bridge, leaving enemies without a good way to attack, while pulling it again will lower it, letting dwarves out and merchants in. All the exploratory mining reveals little iron, so Rawl begins crafting fine bronze armor while the front gets more fortifications in the form of a second story cutout which lets archers shoot from near the barracks. Defensive fortifications ring the area to keep marked dwarves safe from enemy fire, and since everyone's safe while the giant undead birds are in the corner of the map, it's time to venture out and restock on wood. Even the children, especially the children. There's not nearly enough iron to actually make enough steel for everything, but there has been some. The pig iron they're smelting is the first step towards steel weapons. The evil fog still comes around once or twice a season. Everyone still hides from it, but it's barely a spectacle now. It's a little hard to focus on what might be causing it when the dance floor starts going in. A lunite has a lovely pink color, which is perfect for something attention grabbing. The temple is smoothed out and some stone altars go in to let people worship. Honestly, it should have happened a while ago. They've been waiting for a place to pray. Another bard arrives, then another? Is this a way to sneak an entire band in? Worries that some of them might be spies start mounting, but an entire human caravan wants in too. Maybe people are actually proud of Brass Horse for surviving this evil land and attempting to put a stop to the goblin threat, and not doing too shabby a job of it either. The migrants have even helped amass a decent number of animals. The undead threatening the outposts, oh, well, actually it's a hamlet now, are pretty weak, so the grazing animals can actually pasture above ground to hopefully fatten them up some before it's time for slaughter. A human merchant arrives to sell some cheap leather, a scroll and a coat that probably do something, and a couple instruments. It costs a lot for what's almost entirely fluff pieces, but silver is pretty accessible for the craft stores down below, and their goods sell really well. Though feeding everyone might start getting iffy. Between wandering bards and migrant children, there are a lot of mouths to feed, and not much extra food production to actually do it. Zulban's been taken over by the first strange mood that Brass Wars has featured. They monopolize a workshop, and shoot everyone away so that they can focus. More migrants arrive, but it's one soldier and her four kids. Neither of her lovers made it on the trip to this forsaken land. It's little wonder where she picked up that martial skill. At least Zulban finishes, and he made a beautiful ashen amulet. It's only made of wood, sure, but its impeccable craftsmanship and quality is obvious, and it's going to be a treasured heirloom for years to come. With food being an issue, and starvation potentially on the horizon, Brass Wars turns away an entertainer for the first time. Others are going to get a similar answer, at least in the near future. That wood stockpile might seem great, but the much needed metalworking going on without any coal means that this is all going to get burned up very, very very quickly. At least the armor sets are almost done. Soon, everyone's gonna be rocking full bronze. Their chopping all that wood has unintended consequences. The local wildlife is angry. These agitated beasts are more aggressive than normal, though it's unclear how much of an effect it has on already undead monsters who are too blind to attack on sight. The armor doesn't give them a chance to show what they'll do before putting them down, although the corpses are still mangled well beyond being able to be butchered. At least those weren't agitated giant birds that would put up more of a fight. But the dance floor is finished, and the tavern gets some extra walls along the sides that make the place a bit nicer than it did with terrifying walls of pure sand that could cave in at any time. Then a child punches a reanimated skull's head in. That's either really reassuring or downright terrifying. Another autumn, another request for iron and coal from the city. The caravans generally bring the food that Brass Wars still needs, but it'll be interesting to see how much iron and coal they brought after the request from last year. The traders take a while to set up, while Olin counts how much food is left and how much more will be needed to survive the winter. As if to screw his calculations up, seven more migrants show up to finish decimating worryingly empty food stores. At least the outside is safe enough to harvest wild plants, and there are still animals to butcher if absolutely needed. Why are the merchants saying they're leaving soon if they haven't even finished setting up? These are fellow dwarves who have had a clear path in from the start, but they leave without ever trading a single thing. Those goblin lovers hauled a bunch of needed supplies out here to flaunt them, then ran off. What, do they serve some sort of local evil desperate to awaken brass roars? Young as he is, the three-year-old English here lets spite push him into a strange mood. Is this normal for dwarves? He's tiny. Those rocks are as big as he is. In the end, he cuts them into a gem encrusted cup with a carved picture of Rith swallow gear worth thousands. Rith is a baroness from the civilization that founded Brass Wars, which means that Ingus remembered someone he saw when he was one, walked in the evil lands with his mother, then made a masterpiece cup with the baroness's stunning image on it. In 15 or so years, this dwarf is going to be a renowned crafter. Silver altars and statues will give him the kind of environment and inspiration he needs, though these will eventually go in the temple and tavern and not his bedroom. Next is engraving the walls while blocks are cut out for the floor. The first steel ingots go into powerful melee weapons that soldiers will use according to all of their preferences. It'd be ideal if more preferred using maces, 
is, since those are great for caving undead skulls in and actually destroying the abominations, but it is what it is. There should even be a few bars left over to start making some steel armor, although not much for now. Future iron ore will go towards making more steel bars to outfit every soldier in a full set of good armor. The tavern's kind of popping though. Visiting bards mingle with the local ones and relaxing citizens. Well over half the population's in a good mood too. The bedroom layer is looking pretty packed though. It's probably better to spread these out and have people sleep near their work, but that's not really too important until the city is taller. Instead, a wall gets knocked out in the tavern to make room for some beds that'll be rented out to visitors. Oh, let's go through those notifications. Some animals matured, soldiers start training, a giant raven is murdering people, oh no. There's three of these, and one's even fearsome enough to earn a name. The soldiers try to assemble in the halls to venture out, but the beast is sending a brass horse proper before everyone's there. Oh, uh, let's hope the gear and training is enough. Previous little birds died in a hit or two, but the undead only die when a major body part is hacked off. It makes these giant ones hard to actually injure. Armor and dodging keep soldiers safe but not everyone is a soldier. Ingish, the genius crafter child, is the first victim. He was out hauling like a good boy and got caught on the way back into the city. Vengeance is a good motivator, and after what had largely been ineffectual combat, dwarves dole out three quick kills practically back to back. That combat was brutal, and the ravens each took dozens of attacks to go down, but the soldiers did fairly well. A few are injured, but none of it's too serious, and the threat is no more. At what cost? There's only one thing that can be done in a hamlet named Brass Roars. The miners go after Svelarite that they'd largely been ignoring. That zinc, plus the plentiful copper already used for bronze, can be smelted into brass, which will be made into a sarcophagus planted a few levels down below. It gets turned into a proper tomb, and eventually, Ingish is buried here. He was an orphan that came with another family, but he fit right in with the other kids despite that. Perhaps it was the hardships of this evil land that inspired him to craft a legendary artifact shortly before his untimely death. But life has to move on. The army's outfitted in steel mail shirts, so it's time to start working on steel helmets to go along with them. The hospital also picks up an expansion. The raven attack didn't quite overfill the hospital, but it was close, and future attacks will definitely injure more dwarves. Hearing that the army is strong enough to repel undead attacks draws more migrants. A lot of migrants. One wanders up the wrong way and attracted another horde of giant undead birds, but the army's not in any rush to avenge him while the other migrants pick a better path. 30 arrive at once, almost doubling the number of people here in Brass Wars. There were a few bedrooms ready, but not nearly enough to give everyone their own apartment yet. Good news first. After a lot of reorganization, everyone with any kind of combat experience is in one of three squads, bringing Brass Wars up to 23 soldiers. Logan the Weaponsmith is gonna be busy. That's a large upgrade from the 13 soldiers before, although that will mean that they're rocking a mix of steel and bronze armor for a long time. In more mixed news, there's a few new positions. Zahn is elected mayor, though I'm not quite sure why it wasn't Olin or someone else. Zahn and Kubik, who himself got a promotion from militia commander to captain of the guard, now want some extra amenities. A personal study and dining hall, some furniture, and a nicer room than the modest ones everyone else has. Olin's original room and study are torn out and expanded to make room for all of this, though it will take a while to finish building and engraving everything. And now for the bad news. Food and booze are going to be even more difficult to manage going forward. That's double the hungry mouths to feed and twice the livers to destroy, but they didn't bring any more seeds or any anything that will help feed everyone. The animals that Brass Wars has managed to amass can be butchered as a temporary stopgap, but a long-term solution is in order. There are plants on the surface that could be harvested, but doing that is what drew the agitated beast that killed Ingish. No, Dwarven salvation lies further beneath the surface, though there are more preparations to make before delving down. At least the offices look good, although they still aren't quite fancy enough to meet the desires of the Mayor Zahn and Guard Captain Kubik. The soldiers look good too, which is going to be important when delving deeper into the ground. They brutalize half a dozen giant undead blackbirds with only a couple minor injuries, though more steel armor will never hurt. But it might not be enough. Without knowing what's further down on the ground, it's best to prepare with a walled off section in case it's just a little too much. It won't stop everything, but it might give soldiers something to retreat behind if dumb beasts are all that's there. It'll also be sealed off when there are threats above, say more agitated giant ravens circling just inside of the entrance into brass roars. The army even gathers to intercept them when they swing close by, although the beasts back off. Until Dodok picks a fight by shooting a bolt anyway. Ways. These are actually close to useless against the undead, so he just wanted to flip that bird a bronze-tipped metaphorical bird. Overconfidence is a surefire way to fall, but it's hard not to feel some kind of confidence and pride when the army handles these brutal beasts without more than a minor injury. Unarmored civilians would easily fall before their claws, and even one getting in would kill dozens of civilians. Another human trader arrives. That means there's no shipment of iron or coal, but they do sell needed food and clothes in exchange for more silver crafts. The more expensive golden ones are safe for dwarven merchants 
Jones, who will hopefully be tempted into actually trading this year. It's time to finally dig down instead of outwards, although it's impossible to turn down a vein of iron they stumble across. Eventually though, they do hit a cavern. This is a huge expanse, rich in gems, fertile mud, and dangerous creatures. A miner opens up an entrance to the cavern, and someone starts bringing a door down to block it off while Kubik leads some soldiers in. He was one of the original seven that founded Brass Wars, and now he braves the depths to see what's there that could help the growing city above. They map out the tunnels while sneaking around, hoping not to find the more terrifying creatures that could be here. They stumble across troglodytes. These aren't much of a threat, but there's also no reason to attack them. Okay, the soldiers murdered two in cold blood. Another flees in terror because a bunch of shock troopers just ran up and murdered their friends. Maybe not the best introduction. Honestly, these caverns are expansive, but there's not much here beyond silver, copper, tin, and gems. Certainly nothing worth risking too much for. The soil would be good to grow in, but it's so far from everything else. If there were trees down here, it might be worth migrating downwards, but without coal, the villagers need access to the wood on the surface for charcoal. Food will continue being an issue for now because of that, and the farmers are unionizing. Or forming a yield that wants an official hall. There's good space near the farms for it, so it goes there. And while that's underway, a few villagers decide that the cavern can't possibly be that dangerous and wander down to gather the webs to turn them into silk. Instead, they meet a troglodyte that wants revenge, although they are able to retreat before it's too bad. One of those dead troglodytes comes back to life, forcing their grieving friend to beat them to death with their bare hands. The undead continue to assail dwarven spirits too. Another child dies after being assaulted by one. There's even a ghost haunting the fort because his undead corpse couldn't be buried in time. This is going to be an ongoing and growing issue. More birds and beasts attack above, and soon they'll also attack from the cavern. With so many dwarves about, it's easy for individuals to get picked off. Any that do will come back as the undead and attack the others. A city ending chain reaction is just one mistake away. In better news, the gold crafts are moved up in preparation for a trader and wow, that's 19 grand worth of the finest jewelry in one crate. Grass Wars is going to have all the iron and cold I want. The soldiers dream of full steel armor. The traders sit down and actually agree to trade all four iron and four coal they brought. There's some food too, but buying everything the dwarven caravan brought, except for some plump helmets that already litter the pantry, only cost a couple thousand dwarf bucks. Steel helmets and mail shirts will have to placate the soldiers' crushed dreams for now. There are at least more than enough for threats like giant cardinals. These actually aren't undead though, which means that they can be butchered after Mark's dwarves kill them. Good god, Domas, why are you bringing a baby? Oh god, the baby's even injured from prior fights. Why are you doing this to your child? In lighter news, it's time to finally finish that tavern. More floors, move tables, and a new wall to obscure the natural sand. It'll get a fully finished floor eventually, but before that happens, there's darker news. Another dead kid and more to come. Undead ravens descend on a bunch of them. Soldiers rush from the nearby barracks and kill all five of the beasts, but not before they each kill a civilian in turn. It makes finishing the tavern a low note and not the triumph it should have been. Hard times are liable to make some turn to religion, and the godly doctrine asks for a full temple of their own instead of the shared worship space are currently restricted to. It's easy enough to provide near the current altar and bedrooms, although it is a little harder to start mass producing brass sarcophagi and put them all in. There's no time for small but personal tombs. Too many dwarves are just starting to drop. Undead here, agitated animals there, renewed attacks against the surface caused by a necessary presence there to secure wood to fuel smelters and furnaces. Without them, flimsy leather armor would fall before the first real attack. With them, there are always more dangerous attacks to follow. Not even a legendary gem studded floodgate worth 19 grand can change the course of that. Every other artifact only goes for a few thousand, but this is far too precious to sell. Or use, it's not really clear where this would go. Problems continue to arise. Another child drops dead from dehydration near the booze and a proper well down the hall. How? Steel grief production finally starts after miners find enough iron in the deep floors near the caverns. The first pairs don't finish before another set of giant ravens attack, but no sooner do those go down before another set of agitated undead are here. Safety ought to be found underground, but the resources just aren't there. There should have been trees planted in the mud and indoor fields from spores loose from this place. Instead, the caverns are lifeless, save for creatures that flee before dwarven might, but offer nothing in return. As if to emphasize the point, the most terrifying looking monsters to attack yet arrive. Beak dogs are the things of children's nightmares, but no one's sure how savage they are until a couple children demonstrate what the scientific method entails. Soldiers arrive much too late to save them, but at least the beak dogs go down easily enough. The recent deaths mean that the nightmares will continue. The citizens need something to distract them, something to show that they're safe. A throne room fit for a royal is 
maybe not that, but some might feel safer with something that grand. It's a monument to what they've done, and it's not like the average citizen can do much to help the soldiers. Metalworking is limited by finding iron and soldiering, and nearly a third of able-bodied adults in the city spend half their time training. That suddenly seems like it might not be enough though. The goblin threat to the north was known for years, but those wretched goblins have finally expanded their territory south, just like the founding society, the avalanche of wilts, feared. Initial scouting reports suggest that it's just a small place with a population of maybe 50, but it's a dangerous stage of ground at which raids from the Green Menace could gather and resupply. It also represents their first attempt at encroaching and suggests that they'll continue to try and expand. That means it's time for more soldiers. Kubuk, the guard captain, loses his squad of strong and experienced ones. They take his teachings as they form their own squad to continue being an effective fighting force. Kubuk takes a squad of complete novices under his belt. They aren't needed for the city's economy, so they can begin undergoing constant training. The archers also pick up a few more brand new recruits for a total of 40 soldiers. It's a good thing that Risen isn't among them. It took her a lot longer than expected, and plenty more are unhappy with the losses and constant undead attacks, but Risen throws a tantrum that ends in blood being spilled. Mostly hers. She did it in front of a crowd that fight back and send her to the hospital. Not everyone gets to visit there though. One of the recruits fought Kubik, presumably during some sort of sparring match or spat between the two of them. Unfortunately, his captain doesn't yet know how to train with newbies and Kubik punched the recruit's throat out. At least Atir didn't find not having a neck too annoying moments before he bled out from not having a neck. Risen bleeds out in the hospital moments later. Good god, dwarves are dropping left and right. It's not even the undead doing this, it's dwarves killing dwarves to prepare for what are supposed to be greater threats. It's no wonder that more religions start petitioning for temple space. With some already ready, it won't take long for the artwork to arrive and the earth and faith to be pleased. A third temple, well, that'll take a bit longer. Still, they deserve it when the main temple area is so crowded all the time, and that's saying nothing of the happiness that plenty need. The throne room deserves not the most expensive material, but the far more precious brass between blue and pink stone that just looks too good to pass up. Hmm, someone's been missing for a week, and it's impossible to tell why. Goblin kidnappers that snuck in and stole them away? Maybe they died to undead attacks in some corner of a cave that no one else has been to? Maybe they just had a mental breakdown and ran off? Paranoia starts to set in. This goblin apparently came looking to work as an entertainer, but they have no experience performing and are literally a legendary bone carver. This uh, has to be a scout, right? Hopefully they don't notice how reliant Brass Wars is on foreign imports of food and cloth. At least it's easy to afford for now, though long-term growth will require more self-reliance or digging ever deeper for more precious metals. Iron in particular has been strip mined out from easily accessible places, so getting that in the future is going to require digging the more dangerous steps or using minecarts to reach wider. Right now, the soldiers are only halfway to actually having a full set of steel armor. The growing population affords some sense of confidence, and the mood is even slowly improving on average, but plenty more doors are still still angry. Occasionally, a lone dwarf breaks, lashes out, then gets put down by the crowd around them. At least it's not a constant threat. Hopefully adding a few performers to the tavern will help. Hey, where's that goblin bone carver that definitely wasn't a scout? I'm sure they'd love the chance. Where are goblins at at all, actually? Their encroachment made everyone ready for a siege, but summer starts to wane without signs of the brutes. Maybe that bone carver saw the armory and ran off to tell his friends not to come. Patrols still start going out to roam the nearby land to look for brutes on their approach so that Brass Wars isn't surprised. Autumn arrives, which means the outpost liaison is close. They'll likely be surprised by just how far Brass Wars has come, or by a bunch of corpses? Ravens descend on villagers who, again, are out here in this random corner for seemingly no reason. Why do more keep running in to join the pile of corpses? Oh, almost 20 villagers drop, the biggest hit yet by far, before soldiers arrive to clean up. If there's any bleak consolation to be taken here, it's that the army handles them without loss, but that's a very thin silver lining. The bodies are cleaned up before the liaison arrives. He's impressed by both the size and wealth. With the goblins encroachment looming and the obvious success of brass wars, he offers to make this place a proper barony. There's only one choice for the new royal. Zahn might be the mayor, but Olin founded this town and has continued working as a doctor, trader, manager, and bookkeeper to keep it all running. Now, he's royalty. While leaving, the liaison comes under attack by a bunch of undead dingoes. Soldiers rush to his aid and save him just in time. Oh no. It's not a goblin siege threatening brass oars, but an ancient beast named Rathona Frothbile. These forgotten beasts can single-handedly kill larger fortresses, and this little entrance suddenly seems pathetic before them. All 40 soldiers descend into the breach. If it gets through them, the great barony of brass oars will fall. They breathe poison, but it's too late to dig out more space to fight it in. The gas may be a problem, but with so many dwarves, they should only each inhale a little bit of the stuff, because that's how poison works. Bolts and more strike true, but most just bounce off. That doesn't stop resolute dwarves from striking again and again and again. Will they fall? Will it be enough? Barely.
A cloud of crashing dust fills the room. The beast is dead at dwarven hands. Blood covers it, but no one even died. That's the power of training everyone so much to make them good at dodging and equipping them with steel weapons and some pretty good armor to give them that last edge they needed. At least a relatively weak forgotten beast shows this mine shaft's flaws. It's time to add a better way to defend from attacks from the caverns. A long hallway should help Mark's dwarves, and while cutting the stairs off will add a lot of extra travel time down here in the future, that's a small price to pay for more safety from any of the beast's compatriots. Back above, it's little wonder why Brass Wars is a barony now. The trade caravans will have more in the future, but it's easy to buy them out with a few cheap gold crafts. They don't even get the good stuff. Between that and the earlier human caravan, the food supplies actually look pretty good for the first time. It may be possible to import enough even to support a large metropolis like this. Olin wants some finer amenities for himself, but really, he's been fine with modesty for so long, including the cheapest lodging while Zahn and Kubik had more, that he deserves this. He gets the throne room, some nice artwork, and anything else he wants. It is an indulgence, but after leading them all through so much hardship, everyone knows that he deserves it. Everyone else, they deserve safety. The nearby goblins haven't attacked, but their forward staging base is still there. Forget just staying safe and warding off their attacks like the motherland once. Grass Wars is going on the offensive. That only leaves 10 strong soldiers to defend from the undead, but that should do for Brass Wars for a little bit. Olin gets his last royal need taken care of with an impressive tomb, and although it is a little bit morbid to walk past the other more crowded ones, this will still suit him well. Ooh, another artifact, and it's even a brass breastplate. It doesn't make for good armor, but it's the perfect fit for Brass Wars. The venturing soldiers return from their siege mere moments later. They were successful, and with only a single loss to raise the goblin settlement, the throne room gets two final display cases to showcase some artifacts. One for the brass breastplate to represent the great barony and where it's at now, the other is a second artifact, made by the three-year-old Ingish shortly before he was the first loss of the undead scourge, to where it came from. Brass Wars has more years ahead of it. The goblins will continue trying to come, and in greater numbers after their first encroachment burn. More brutal forgotten beasts can rise up from the caverns, and who knows what else is laying there lurking. But Brass Wars is established now, and it's strong. There's more to tell, but I think I want to play a harsher challenge. This was a welcome back to the game that got me into what's now my favorite genre 10 years ago. I think it's time for a real challenge. Subscribe if you're interested in seeing that, and while you're at it, if you like this video, check out some of mine on Going Medieval. It's not as deep for a colony sim, but the visuals are all in 3D, which makes it a lot more fun to build big forts, castles, and mega buildings. 